when I teach the, the thesis classes, uh, regardless of what institution I've worked at, you know, one of the questions that I often get, um, you know, is, is why in a master's program we would invest so much time and, for that matter, so much course content to a systematic research project um, that involves a significant amount of scholarly writing. And, um, you know, there are a number of reasons why, um, but I guess to, to, you know, start off with, um, oops, these didn't come out in the order I want them, sorry. That's one of the nice things about it. So, to start off with answering that question, um, I'd have a question for you, and I, I can't see your video, so I'm going to have to rely upon you guys using the chat to respond to this, but how many of you were at some point in your teacher preparation program taught about student learning styles and um, taught about the different learning styles and how we should uh, cater our pedagogy and cater our instruction to the different ways that students learn based specifically upon learning styles or learning modalities. I see a couple of folks responding in the chat box. Okay. Um, it's about two-thirds of you have responded and two-thirds of you had indicated yes. Um, and, um, you know, in all honesty, that is a common thing that we see in teacher preparation programs, not just ones that you guys experience, but, uh, you know, I've taught in four different universities in four different, I guess you can't really call the Midwest a corner. I was going to say four corners of the country, but really three corners of the country and then kind of the middle. Because uh, the Northeast, the Southeast, obviously now I'm in, I, you don't really consider yourselves in California part of the Southwest, I'd imagine. But geographically speaking, it kind of, it, it is in the Southwest, even if it doesn't have... Um, that kind of connotation to it, uh, and in the Midwest, and it's something that I see in teacher prep programs quite commonly. The problem with that is, is that when you actually look at the research that goes into um, learning styles, the truth is, is that there is no reliable and valid research to support the idea that teachers should design and present their instruction in an effort to accommodate individual learning styles. Now there's reasons for that and, and if, if this was a more of a methodology course we could get into the fact that um, learning style inventories are largely based upon self-report and self-report is a, a notoriously unreliable form of research. Um, but, you know, the basic idea behind this is that, you know, we have a whole generation of teachers and I would say multiple generations of teachers because just in this group uh, that we've got here, you know, we've got folks that were educated, um, you know, went through at least their teacher ed programs in the 80s. Myself, I went through mine in the 90s. I'm sure there's folks in here that uh, went through their teacher education programs in the the knots or the you know o o to o nine time period. There may even be folks that have gone through in the last seven years. You know, so we've got potentially up to four decades of you know teacher education programs represented just in this room here tonight. And I'm willing to bet that at some point in time, all of us, particularly in our initial preparation programs where we got that initial certification, were taught about learning styles. We're taught about, you know, the Gardner's intelligences or Colby's uh, experiential learning or just basic learning styles of, you know, visual, auditory, tactile, kinesthetic, um, you know, and, and unfortunately there isn't research to support any of this stuff. Um, you know, similarly, when you look at what do we actually know about things that impact student performance. So here's a list of 11 things that we have research on. Actually, there's a whole list of them. I just picked out 11 uh, at random that we have actually a great body of research on to indicate what kind of impact these things have on student 
performance. Now, again, using the chat box, one of the things I'd ask you is looking at this list. If you were to pick the top two things that you think have the greatest impact upon student learning, positive impact that is, what are the two things that you would pick? I'm going to open up my chat box here just so it shows up. I should probably not have it on top of the list. Okay, I see four or five people have contributed. What about the other four or five folks? What do you think are the top two things that can have a meaningful impact upon student learning? Meaningful positive impact. Okay, I think that's most folks. I'm going to close out the box here, but I still have it open on my test account, so anyone else that writes, I can still see that as well. Um, so, in case you were wondering how this breaks down, of the 11 things, I actually had them listed in the order that they appeared. Um, so the one I had listed first was the uh, most important one, or the one that had the, 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 the highest ranking in terms of... Uh, the positive impact upon student performance, the one I had listed as 11, um, was obviously the 11th. But you can see here, and, and the reason I mention this is because when you look at a lot of what we do in education, in many cases it either isn't based upon good research, or if it is based upon research, um, the research isn't necessarily as reliable, or there are things that have greater bang for their buck. You know, as an example, let's take two things off of this list. Feedback and individualized instruction. And um, In this day and age, individualized instruction often gets called um, personalized instruction or personalized learning. And that's probably a term that many of you, um, you know, have come across uh, in, in your own work, this idea of personalized learning. Um, you know, so what factors into your ability to provide feedback to your students? And again, you can type this out in the chat box, or for that matter, feel free to grab the mic and answer that way as well. So what factors into your ability to provide feedback to your students? <laughs> I'm sensing a theme here. And yeah, I mean, that's true. And if you've got 25 students, in theory, you have 25 divided by X amount of time. If you've got 15 students, you've got 15 divided by that same X amount of time. Now, in terms of individualized instruction or personalized learning, um, one of the things, sorry, I'm still reading through the uh, text or the chat messages as they're coming in, and that's making me laugh a little. Um, you know, when you look at individualized instruction, the way that gets operationalized in most districts um, and some of you are experiencing this right now, oftentimes is through some sort of computerized assisted instruction, where the students are essentially working through the content in an adaptive way based upon artificial intelligence that's built into a computer program. Now, at the end of the day, somebody has to sit down and say, okay, I have $300,000 to spend on improving student performance in this school. I can take 200,000 of that and buy licenses for a computer program that can be implemented in all of the elementary schools that um, you know will help us do personalized learning and then use some of the other uh, money that's left over to train the teachers on how to do that. Or I can just hire, what, $300,000 would probably get you, what, another two or three, four teachers 
uh, depending on where they're coming in at the salary scale. Um, you know, and that will allow me to decrease the student to teacher ratio in this particular school by four students per teacher. You know, when you start making those sort of cost effective decisions based upon what the research says, the decreasing your class size by three or four students per teacher obviously allows you to do more of this. That according to the research, has almost four times the bang for the buck that spending that money on an individualized instruction or personalized learning program would be. You know, so research is important for these reasons. You know, the ability to make effective decisions on how we can improve student outcomes at a systems level, but also on an individual level. You know, as a classroom teacher, you have the ability to decide whether or not you are going to, you know, assign homework that you collect and grade that takes you 90 minutes to grade each day, or you're going to take those 90 minutes and provide feedback on the work that the students had done in class. You know, again, according to just this list of 11 here, again, that 90 minutes on feedback as opposed to that 90 minutes on grading homework is twice as effective. Um, you know, so even at the classroom level, we can start to make some decisions about the types of things that we change about our practice based upon the research that we've got available. Now, I mentioned this in the Clark 83 video, but I'll bring it up again because um, one of the nice things about Canvas is, is I can track what students are clicking on and stuff. So I know if there's, you know, things that are being skipped over because um, then it allows me to sort of spend more time on it in other formats. Um, and, and noticing that, um, you know, the Clark 83 video that I produced where I talk about this and I include a portion of one of Hattie's videos in there um, hasn't been viewed that much yet. I wanted to talk a little bit about him tonight. Um, if one of these four books aren't on your bookshelf right now, um, in all honesty, they should be, or at least one of them should be. Um, given the fact that you're all classroom teachers, um, actually I shouldn't say that because I think if I remember correctly I've got a few, um, again I can't remember the term in California, an instructional coach I think is what you guys taught me last class. Um, but essentially that um, you know, grade level support person or that school level support person. Um, but for those of you that are, are classroom teachers, and particularly if you don't have much of a research bent, um, the blue book that you see on the screen is one that I would highly recommend. If I remember correctly on Amazon, these are all about 20 or $25. Um, one of them should be on your bookshelf. One of them should be on the bookshelf of every single educator as far as I'm concerned, regardless of what level they teach at. Um, elementary, high school, middle school, university, co community college, doesn't matter. Um, these are incredible books. Uh, they are incredibly useful uh, if you approach them with an open mind and want to change your practice based upon them. Now, what they are actually doing in these books is um, what it's a a research program that John Hattie's put together uh, called Visible Learning, where essentially what he did, and this is when he produced the white book that you saw on the screen, which was the first one. At that time, he had taken essentially a decade and a half of research where they were looking at comparing the impact of different types of either structural design, pedagogical things, um, and, you know, instructional aspects within the classroom to, you know, how we um, structured schools and there were, if I remember correctly, it's 137 different um, conditions that he found uh, when he did the initial analysis. They had over 800 meta-analysis and if you're not familiar with a meta-analysis, essentially it's when you take a bunch of studies where you study, you know, 200 kids that, you know, 100 of them were doing one thing and the other 100 were doing something else and you combine the 15 studies or 20 studies or 10 studies like that into a larger study to give you a higher statistical power. Well, he took 800 of those that included over 50,000 individual studies, and his initial analysis was approximate, had approximately uh, half a million students involved in those studies looking at essentially what do we know about how to improve learning. Um, 
you know, and one of the interesting things is that uh, I guess the good news, and, and if you've watched the Clark 82 video, he actually comes right out and says this, there's very little that we can do that actually make kids dumber. Um, just about everything that we do in the educational environment has some positive impact. I say just about everything. There are a couple that don't, um, but just about everything has some positive impact. Um, one of the nice things about the idea of effect sizes is that you can actually take the what we know from all of these smaller individualized studies and be able to generalize them over a much larger area. Um, the latest analysis that um, um, he has looks at this idea of typical effects. Um, so this sort of speedometer, if you will, down here, um, where we look at what are the things that uh, have more bang for their buck, if you will. You know, using that example of I've got X number of dollars at the school or at the district, or for that matter, as a teacher, I have X number of hours that I can invest into this. What should I do? And when you're looking at this kind of speedometer, um, one of the things that he found was that essentially a student will advance approximately 0.15 of a standard deviation just by getting a year older and a year wiser. So if you have a, a kid who is in the class of a bad teacher, just the fact that they are sitting in that room for a year, their developmental effect will be essentially 0.15 standard deviations. Now, if you have an average teacher, not a good teacher, an average teacher, an average teacher will have an effect size of approximately 0.25 standard deviations. So if you have a kid that's getting a year older and a year wiser, in the classroom of an average teacher, that kid will move 0.4 standard deviations. So their outcomes, if you will, what they know uh, about that particular subject or that particular grade level will increase by 0.4 standard deviations. So what Hattie argues, and, and when you look at the research methodology behind meta-analysis, it makes actually perfect sense. Uh, and I'm not a real strong stats guy, so I have to be honest with you and say that I had to rely upon the explanations that he provided largely in the white-covered book uh, that I showed you before. Um, if we're actually going to invest significant amounts of money or significant amounts of time, we want to look at things that are going to have a positive impact of 0.4 standard deviations or higher. Because that's how much a kid would move if we did very little in terms of effort to actually move them forward. Now, when you look at the things that are at the very top of Hattie's list of 137, and you can actually, um, I think in the Clark 83 video in the description of it, I actually include the link to the website for um, the all where you see all 137 items, but if you just look at the top 10 things uh, that you have available to you, um, you know, there are some things here that as classroom teachers we have a great deal of control over. Uh, there are some things here that as classroom teachers we have literally no control over. Um, you know, students' prior achievement, which as you can see has a significant impact. Um, we don't have much control over what happened to the kid you know, when they took that math class in grade 9 when you're teaching grade 10 math or what happened to them in grade 3 when you're teaching grade 4. But many of these things here we actually ha do have a fair amount of control over. Um, you know, and it's worth thinking about these things and I always introduce this at the beginning of any thesis process because as you look through the 137 things that are there, particularly those of you that are doing sort of action research kinds of things, um, it's really useful to consider these, uh, particularly the things that are, you know, in the top 20 or 25 or even anything that's 0.4 or higher um, as, you know, how can you incorporate some of this into your own action research. Um, you know, so when we look at some of the lessons that Hattie draws out from a, a teacher perspective, um, when, and these largely come out of that blue book, and he spends a, a fair amount of time 
um, talking about each of these. But, you know, here's some of the things that we know from a research perspective that actually have a positive impact upon students. Um, and when you think about your own thesis project, you know, how much of this is built into the action research cycle that you're looking at? Um, you know, are these things things that you can actually use as a way to test the efficacy of some of the things that you are trying to do? Um, you know, and as you look at the, that list, you know, and, and I'd encourage you to click on the, the link in, in the YouTube video that shows you what all 137 of them are. Uh, because, you know, when you look at the research process, and uh, this actually comes directly to the Chanel article that you're, uh, that's been assigned to you in the, for uh, the asynchronous time next week, um, he comes up with this list of 10 things that essentially these are the 10 steps that you are going to undertake in any sort of research process. And regardless if you are doing the um, project route or if you're doing the thesis route, you know, essentially these are the kinds of steps that you're going to take. Um, you know, they'll slightly differ in terms of, of the language that they use. So for example, if you are doing a research, if you're doing the thesis study, you're going to be doing more of number four. If you're doing the project, it's more of number five. Um, you know, develop your research design, that would be develop your project design if you were doing um, the project route. Uh, as you look through, you know, conduct, plan, conduct, and manage the study, you know, plan, conduct, and manage the instructional design process is what you would have there. And when you sort of break this down in terms of how this runs through your classes, um, all of the things that you see in blue are things that in theory should have been covered in 710. Um, so these are things that you should have uh, pretty reasonable ideas on as you walked into uh, six or sorry 716. The things in red are really what 716 is about, although there is some overlap with number nine because of the timing of the school year and your need to actually con collect your data right now. Um, so while the actual content of 795 covers number nine more, the actual activity of number nine is something you're likely probably going to be doing uh, before 795 starts. Um, and the green stuff is the stuff that you would normally do in 795. Now, um, so in theory, what we would have largely started to do at the beginning of this semester was, you know, really get into our lit review. And the way, if you notice, the original schedule uh, in the syllabus was set out was, you know, we would really be focusing a lot, um, really starting this week on, you know, how do I consume the literature that's available, how do I determine if it's a good study or bad study, how do I make uh, judgments on um, the quality of the source of publication, those kinds of things, which we've pushed off now to really march, uh, you know, as we try to refine some of these things up here in blue. But it, it's always useful when you're in this process to sort of know, you know, these are the steps that I've got to take and these are, you know, roughly the order in which they should go and roughly the stage at which in the process I should be doing these things. Um, so that's sort of all that I have here in this initial one. Um, I, I want to pause for a bit to give you a chance to ask questions.